LinkedIn News. From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Now, last fall, my wife and I set out to replace our car. Our family had expanded by a couple of kids and soon to be a dog, and the car had not. We did all this research before we even went shopping. I borrowed my dad's subscription to Consumer Reports. We made a spreadsheet. We listed every type of vehicle. We made these calculated bets on whether we thought the electric charge infrastructure was going to improve in Brooklyn in the next decade. And then we chose our car. We brought it home. And immediately, everywhere around us, everyone seemed to have this car. A quarter of the people in our building have this same car. I know because I look out the window into our parking lot every day and I see it. They're even the same color. You know, I thought we were being so original. But as it turned out, we'd had the same idea as everyone else at pretty much the exact same time. That's how decisions work, of course. We're influenced in all kinds of subtle ways by so many things around us. Just ask anybody in the marketing field. I mean, they probably knew before I did what kind of car we would get. But I'm an American, and more specifically, a product of this moment in history. I have been raised on this notion of the self. I'm independent. I make my own decisions. As my two-year-old says all the time, I can do it myself. So what exactly is the self? Today's guest is Brian Lowry. He's a social psychologist, and he runs the Leadership for Society program at the Stanford Business School. His new book is Selfless, The Social Construction of You. Brian's thinking challenges most of what our culture teaches us about self. He argues we are fundamentally social beings, and our sense of self is constructed through relationships. Sure, physical characteristics matter. Genetics play a role in who we are. But our self is always changing and best understood as a product of our interactions with others. Okay, so why is this important? Well, it reshapes how we think about our relationships with our colleagues and our friends. So often we feel the need to be right about things, to set up a binary. This leads to conflict that can leave us feeling really stuck. So what if, instead, we let go of rigid individualism? We embrace this concept that the self is socially constructed. We are all reproducing our ideas together. According to Brian's reasoning, we can change others when we make shifts in ourselves. And we can change ourselves by switching up the people with whom we spend our time. I'm going to let Brian take it from here. The self is a construction of the relationships and interactions you have with others, that we are fundamentally social beings. To, you know, exist as a human means to exist in relationships. And I take that very, very seriously and and push that to, I think, to a, a place where most people wouldn't take it on their own, right? What does it mean if we take it seriously that we exist in relationships? Well, um, I think the place that really caused me to to stop and think about what you were offering was the place very early in the book when you essentially asked me to reconsider my sense of self as rather a reflection of those relationships, that independent of those relationships, whatever I conceive of as Jesse is, is perhaps not, certainly not static. What I'm suggesting is that People think of the self as a static physical thing. I think when they, I don't think they think about it. That's just their intuition. I just think that's how they, if you ask them or push them, they're like, I'm me. And they mean something like the way they physically exist in the world. Right. But when you push people, that that's not really, I think, what they mean. If they reflect on it and you say, what does it mean to be Jesse? And when you think about what that means, you think about, okay, well, Jesse likes to do these things. Jesse has these relationships. Jesse's lived in these places. Jesse's childhood was like this or like that. All those things end up being social. And I don't really think what people mean is 
Jesse's, I don't know how tall you are. Let's say you're five seven. I don't okay, know. we can go with that. You can't see that I'm five three in here, so let's go with five seven. <laughs> you know, and and Jesse has brown hair, and those things are a part of you. But I don't think when people think of themselves, that's really what they have in mind. Because if tomorrow or let's let's say 30 years from now, so you seem pretty young, all your hair is gray. You're not like, I'm not Jesse anymore because my hair isn't brown. You don't, you don't, I mean, I don't think people be- would think that way. Right. right. Um, but if I fundamentally altered your relationships, I think you would be a different person. Right. Well, so a lot of what your book gets to and and elaborates upon is the ways in which my sense of who I am are influenced by all of these relationships around me. And it leads to a question, okay, well, what what simply is? Is like, you know, what is a personality? What is a genetic trait? What exists? Yeah. Um, and so this is complex. I, I'll, let me just say say that first. I think that clearly there are, there's a physical reality of you. Um, I just don't think that's when you say yourself, that's what you have in mind. Like, do you have a temperament? Sure. Um, is that genetically influenced? Yes. But also just to be clear, genetics are not destiny, right? So you have, they set up some rules, right? They said, maybe they set up a ceiling, maybe, but it's not as if your, your, your genes have dictated in a, in alone any aspect of yourself, right? There's all sorts of things that influence how they, how they are um, made manifest. And if you want to be technical, your phenotype, right? Right. Um, I think that what is real in an objective sense matters because it interacts with the social. And so I'll say more about what I mean. If, so I'll just use what go with race. I'm black. That only has meaning in the context of social relationships. Like there's no, is there an objective reality to my skin tone, my facial features, my hair texture? Yes. But none of that means black, except that people understand it in that way. Yep. And so when I come out and I go into the world, those physical features of me, which I believe exist in an objective way, only influence who I am and how people see me through social means, through the cultural understanding of what that means, through people's prior history with what they considered other black people to be like. So does it matter? Yes. Does it dictate who I am as a objective feature of the world? No, I don't think so. Yeah. As I read your book, I thought so much about what it means to live in the United States and to live in this moment in history and to live in a very individualistic moment within an individualistic uh, culture. You know, when I was a you know white upper middle class person, I was born into a world where people began saying to me as soon as I had language, what do you want to be? You get to choose. What mark are you going to make in the world? Your book caused me to think about the ways in which maybe that doesn't serve us as we try to address a lot of the more intractable problems in the world right now. I love that you got there like that. That, that warms my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't spell it well, out for you, me. Jesse. I mean, in the conclusion of the book, you were very direct. You were, you know, I have so many business books that come across my desk, which give me frameworks, often very useful frameworks. You explicitly said, I am not going to do that for you. And so you have forced me to figure out how to do it for myself over here, Brian. <laughs> well, good, good. I, I love that it worked for you. Wow. Okay. Because I was like, some of the people are going to hate me. I'm like, what? What are the four <laughs> steps? I'm like, I don't know what the four steps are. Um, so, yeah. And I think... And I'm not the only one to think this. So um, what makes human beings what we are is that we exist socially, that we cooperate, that we create the world collectively. Um, And we live in these societies which pretend to forget that. Mm -hmm. And I say pretend because, and I, I teach, I say this all the time, there's nothing, there's almost nothing in the room that you're in right now that any one person in this world could produce. Like the world we live in is so complex and so interrelated. It it, it could not exist um, without an almost infinitely complex interaction among many, many, many human beings. 
Um, and when we behave as if we can exist as islands onto ourselves, that we can decide independent of the social context into which we were born, it's maybe it's a useful fiction. Maybe it allows us to engage in the world in a particular way, but it's almost certainly false. It's just objectively false. Right. Um, but again, but I do want to point out that doesn't mean it's not useful right. to think that way, to have that belief. It's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian has established that we're all really interconnected, but he also points out that we don't really think about our lives that way. And that's a problem especially when it comes to one of the things that we really love to do, which is figure out how to change things about ourselves. One big aha moment that I had when I read Brian's book is that a lot of us are just really bad at making changes because we don't understand ourselves in the context of others. So we just target the wrong incentives in trying to make those changes. Consider this story from a colleague of Brian's who studied environmentalism in hotels. In this study... They were trying to get people to um, not have the towels washed as much. For obvious reasons, like, I mean, the obvious reasons to cost the hotel more, the hotels more money. But it also right. is not as environmentally friendly. I mean, we can all think of a time when we've been in a hotel recently and we've seen the little card that says, you know, we're trying to save the environment. If you want to help, you know, you can not have your towel mm -hmm. washed. Mm -hmm. And so what they were doing was playing with those little signs, right? So they had different messages on the signs. And I, I won't get it ex exactly right, but th it'll be close enough. So <laughs> one of the signs, it says something like, save the environment. We'll only wash the towel if you put it on the floor or turn the card over or whatever it was. But it was in essence, like save the environment, be a good citizen. And there are other ones, but the one that's more most interesting, think of this comparison is um, people who have stayed in your room before have not had their tiles washed every day. If you don't want to have your towel washed, turn this card over. And what's interesting about it is if you ask someone, do you care what the person in this room pre previous to you did? Say no. Like, do you care about being a good environmental citizen? Sure. But it turns out that there's a benefit to highlighting what the person in your room did. Actually, and this is another part, even more so than just finding out what people do. Like, that's a, an important comparison. So if I tell you people only have their towels washed and making this up, you know, every other day. Yeah. Or people in your room only have their towels washed every other day. It turns out that what people in your room do has more of an influence on you than other people generally. And it looks like it's because you feel some identity with that person because you're staying in the same room. Now, What's amazing about that is no one thinks they care about the person stayed in the room previously, but they're being influenced by what they've been told that person does. And this is just an example of we don't have good awareness of what's influencing us. I, I want to just stay on that for a second, because I think that like that that beginning to really understand that also sets us up to make better decisions um, in, in every aspect of our lives. And and I, I began to see that in all these aspects of my own life. I'll give you mm. an example. My wife and I went car shopping recently. We had to replace our car. And we did lots of research and we looked at various things and we found a car and we brought that car home. And it was only when we got home that we looked up and we noticed that everybody else in our neighborhood also had that car. <laughs> we were like, what? I never even thought about this car before. We just discovered it and bought it like two weeks ago. And it was, you know, only one of the myriad ways in which I realized that the social system in which I, the micro system in which I exist is deeply influencing every decision that I make. You know, you go two neighborhoods over in Brooklyn and everybody's driving a different yeah, I mean, car. It really is amazing how much the context we're in affects us in ways we just cannot see yeah. or don't see. It's the sort of thing where if you go into a restaurant it's it's highly likely that what you're talking about with your wife is being influenced by what the person behind you is talking about in ways you don't even realize. Like you heard some snippet of what they were saying, didn't really pay attention to it, and now it's shifting what you're talking about right. in your own. And this is happening all the time to us. I mean, the influence of other people is so um, ubiquitous, mm -hmm. um, subtle, but profound. Right. So it's like it's changing what car you buy. 
right. you know, ways you don't notice. Right. And what car I buy, by the way, is a, is a fairly conscious decision, right? Like I was aware of it mm-hmm. pretty quickly after it happened. I was able to point to it. But then now let's just dial that down a few levels and think about all the subconscious things of which I'm not aware right this second that are being influenced by the, the communities in which I, I live. It's so interesting. Like, I bet you those glasses are Brooklyn glasses. Yeah, okay. The ones you're wearing That's right true. now. <laughs> 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 and that's a Brooklyn haircut you're wearing, yep. too. <laughs> yeah. No, it's totally um, It's, <laughs> yeah, almost every, like, the color of clothes you're picking, like, the, the way your hair is styled, all these things are being influenced in ways that you're just not paying attention to. You feel like, I just went to the store and picked this because I liked it. Right. right. And that's you. It reflects who you are. And this gets to the point of the self being construction. You think of like what makes you you. It's hard to separate those decisions from the influences that other people are having on you. Which brings us to what to me is the most interesting aspect of a conversation that shifts our notion of self, which is that so many of the decisions I make, whether it's what school is best for my child, or how I actually do contribute to environmentalism in my neighborhood, um, I think I'm making on behalf of myself and with some sort of autonomy. But if I could reframe the way that I approach those decisions, I might make them differently. If I make those decisions aware that I'm making the decision as a social creature, that I'm making a decision That is also a product of the way that my neighbors think about this or my colleagues or coworkers think about this. I might think about it differently, right? I think so. Every decision you make is a decision that influences other people and has been influenced by others. And I think being clear about that might change the kind of decisions or it might change the way you engage with those decisions is what I would say. And this goes back to the point of the the deep individualism of the moment we live in and the culture we live in, um, that there's a degree of unwarranted narcissism, I think, in that. By that I mean it doesn't reflect the reality that we live in and has such a faith in the individual self um, that's misplaced. Yeah. What would it mean if we took seriously... Um, the influence that people have on us and our responsibility to other people when we act because we're also constructing them. We're affecting them, right? What does that look like if we take that seriously? Right. Um, And in some ways, it's a pretty powerful thing because we also know that sometimes when we consider the needs of others, we make better decisions even than when we consider our own needs as an individual, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And by the same token, I think that there's such pain in thinking that you yourself, your idea of self, carries the weight of responsibility for fixing some of the problems that are before us, right? Those large, intractable, massive problems that my children will undoubtedly inherit. Like One really harmful narrative in our culture is that they are the faults of individuals rather than a collective fault. And I wonder if that both saddles us with something that makes it impossible to operate or take action um, and also perhaps misplaces both the origin and the point of action. Yeah, this is where sometimes I have a hard time even wrapping my head around my own ideas. I experience myself as an individual separate from other individuals and making my own decisions, like completely responsible for them as an individual carrying the weight of that. But when I step back and, and think about how the world works and think about what I know of psychology and sociology, I'm really just a node in an incredibly complex network. Um, Do I act and affect things? Yes. But am I doing that from some, like, I don't know, Standing someplace uninfluenced by others, certainly not. Yeah. Um, so to your your point, if I can hold on to the idea that I'm being influenced by others, I'm being constructed by others, that should allow me a degree of grace toward myself. Mm. Yeah. Um, if you can let go of that idea of a self as an island 
you know, generating actions out of nothing that are having influences on other people, having responsibility to correct things that are certainly beyond what's possible for you as an individual, like that is a heavy burden to carry. But if you take seriously what I'm saying, there's no reason to carry that burden. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You are a part of a collective. Like, do you have your part to play? Yes. Can you alter the nature of reality on your own as if you're some, <laughs> some type of God? No, you cannot do that. Um, and it also... I think should give you a degree of empathy for others, right? They also are constructed in their moment. Like when you go to Tupelo, Mississippi, like the people there are a product of the, their mm -hmm. social context as well. And so if there are things there that you're like, oh, this is not so great, it's not to absolve anyone of complete responsibility, but you can understand them differently if you understand them in their context. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, more on the idea of self from Brian Lowry. And we're back. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, Brian is a professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, the GSB. And the GSB is a vibrant place. Walking around campus is going to remind you how many successful and impactful founders have spent time in its classrooms. Just look at the names on the front doors. Now, Brian's work is very theoretical, very different. Business school, it's, it's typically full of students who are ready to get out in the world and put their skills to use. They are practical. So I wanted to understand what Brian is doing at the GSB. I'm interested in people. Um, I'm not interested in, in this particular context or that particular context. I'm interested in how people function, and that applies to business. Um, there is this weird thing about me in that I am probably at the intersection of psychology and philosophy in terms of my, my interests, um, as opposed to being really tightly focused on a particular outcome. Right? And I think that's what people have in mind when they think of business. Like, how are we going to affect this managerial outcome? And I, I, I tend not to think in, in that way. Um, but I do think it's relevant to business school. And I, in, in my class, I, I have a program called Leadership for Society. And one of the things, I'm, for example, I might ask them, what's your role in having a positive effect in society? How do you think about that? How do you assess your success and failure with regard to that. Businesses have a huge impact on society, especially now. And people in business school, and certainly at Stanford, are likely to go out and have an inordinate amount of influence in the world. And to help them think about themselves and the role they play, um, how people exist in society seems like an important thing to talk about and think about. And that's what I do with them. <laughs> <laughs> when you begin by by framing the question, how do you think about what it might mean to have a positive impact on society? What does what does positive impact mean? Ah. That's gotta be the first question they ask you. Well, no, they think they already have an answer to that. This is where I push oh, back against them. That's what that question you asked me is the question I asked <laughs> I asked them. Um Here's what I, I push them on. Depending on the time scale, it's hard to know what a positive effect will be. You might think you're doing the right thing and 50, 100 years from now, it could turn out that you did this thing that made the world incredibly bad. Here's an example Brian gave me about the way impact changes. Thomas Midgley Jr. invented leaded gasoline. He solved a huge problem for cars at that time. Engines knocked or stalled less often, and so cars became more useful. And so more people got and used them, which was great. But also it turns out with the lens of history that that wasn't so great for the environment. Now, of course, that couldn't really ever be known in Midgley's lifetime, though. So it's like this discovery seemed fantastic. Right. A hundred years later, it turns out to be kind of terrible. Right. Right. So what I, what I think about this is the best you can do is engage with your current moment in good faith. Yeah. Like it's hard to know long-term what the consequences of what you're doing are, but 
engaging in your current moment in good faith takes work. That was Brian Lowry, social psychologist, Stanford professor, and author of the new book, Selfless, The Social Construction of You. Check it out. This week, we have another new segment. You know, there are so many important books coming out all the time. Books that impact cultural conversation, books that introduce new ideas. I mean, we can't bring all of the authors on the show, although Lord knows I would love to. But what I want to start doing here is just to make sure that you know about the important books coming up. So every few episodes, I plan to invite my colleague, Scott Ulster, to offer up a recommendation. Now, Scott, he reads a ton. Scott and I go way back. We first met each other when we were both writers and editors at Fortune. Over here at LinkedIn, he helps organize our book coverage. He sees everything. And he's going to share the important things with us. So without further ado, I have in the studio today, Scott. Hey, Scott. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, I'm great. I am excited to hear about what is at the top of your reading pile this week. Yeah, sure. So one of the the books that's really struck me uh, this week is a book called Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond. Poverty by America? Yeah, it's a provocative title. And I think it's it's all on purpose. I mean, Desmond... He breaks the mold from what you might consider the typical poverty book. And there is. There's a specific subgenre of poverty books where the focus is all on specific profiles of people who are experiencing poverty, in this case in America. Now, there's a pile of books that you could consider that all do that extremely well. But what Desmond does instead is ask what I think is a particularly unique question, provocative question, which is, do we need to have poverty in America at all? Yeah. Why? Why is this still with us in in one of the wealthiest nations in the history of the world? Um, it is indeed a provocative question. Honestly, I'd always taken it as a, a given even that some some subset of society would live in poverty. One thing about that that genre, as you map it out, that he diverges from, is that it's incredibly readable. You have characters, mean characters, you get very invested in their lives, these people in poverty. Is Matthew's book readable? It, it is. And I think it's because he's he's aware of that fact, right? It's not like he's absent from that genre entirely. He uses a handful of profiles and people's stories to establish much larger points about what makes poverty so persistent in the United States, those key drivers. And then he basically makes the point that even though we do think of poverty as this fixture in America, it's actually a result of a series of choices that we make on an individual level and on a systemic level. And that, in fact, it doesn't need to be this way, that the way we live our lives and the way we structure our society does not be, need to be the way that it, it is today. Do you come away from this book feeling hopeful? I'd say so, yes, because Desmond's solutions aren't pie in the sky. They seem to be very much down to earth. You know, these are things like reconsidering whether those companies that we are buying products from are supporting their workers and paying them a living wage, or reconsidering the way that our tax system is structured and whether a lion's share of of those who are paying taxes are actually paying their fair share. These are things that, you know, certainly we've read about, but the way he describes them are indeed approachable. I love that. Um, so, Scott, leave us with one tiny detail, something you take away that you're going to remember. The key figure from Desmond's book, uh, a figure that's within reach, it's $177 billion. And that's the amount that Desmond has calculated that it would take to eradicate poverty altogether in the United States. So $177 billion that is such a big number to try to wrap my mind around. Help me understand what exactly that number is. So $177 billion is the amount of money that it would take to eradicate poverty altogether. And that would mean that everyone in the United States would have enough uh, to eat, enough food, and to have a place to live. These are the basic necessities. For $177 billion, basically, we're just talking about getting the people in America to pay the taxes that they already owe. So if people just paid the taxes they owed 
and I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that it's really rich people taking advantage of all the loopholes they can find to not quite uh, make the mark. If people just paid what they owed, we could potentially use that money to eradicate all of poverty. That's exactly correct. Yep, that's a big idea. And that, Scott, is why we're really glad to have this new book segment. (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. Now, our weekly reminder to join us for office hours. We'll talk about unseen influences this week, what changes about your decision-making when you try to take your community into account. How about when you reflect on the ways you might have been influenced or can influence others? We'll talk about it on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, live on the LinkedIn news page. I hope you'll join us. You can also continue the conversation in our Hello Monday group on LinkedIn. To join, click right from the show notes. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn News. Sarah Storm produces our show. It's engineered and mixed by Asaf Gidron. Our theme music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Rafa Faria, Lolia Briggs, Wallace Truesdale, Kanaya Rogers, and Michaela Greer help us construct our sense of self. Enrique Montavo is our executive producer. Dave Pond is head of news production. Courtney Coop is head of original programming. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. We'll be back next Monday. Thanks for listening.